Hello, and welcome to this lesson about our geologic backdrop. How is today's climate situated within what we know about the past? The long-term story is that Earth's climate changes over time. There's evidence for very icy conditions in the past. For example, you might have heard about snowball Earth, and there's evidence for quite warm conditions with no ice on the planet at all, like when the dinosaurs were around. We're gonna focus our attention here mostly on our recent geologic scene, the ice age cycles of the past one million years or so, which lead up to our present situation. How does our scenario today fit within the context of the past million years? How is the climate changing now in ways that are unlike what happened in the past million years? Here are some estimates of surface temperature data for the past million years. Time runs from left to right. Our climate today, at time zero on the right, follows a long series of warm, cold climate cycles. These cycles occur with regularity. They aren't random or chaotic. And these data show that the temperature differences between the cold periods and the warm periods is about five degrees or so. So, for example, the most recent ice age, 20,000 years ago, that valley in the data closest to the right, was about five degrees Celsius cooler than Earth is today. That doesn't sound like much, but that was a time when Canada and parts of Northern Europe were covered with ice. Sea levels were about 120 meters lower than today, and woolly mammoths roamed around. Let's try a question. During this million years of time, we see that these large climate cycles happened. About how long does each of these cycles last? There's certainly some variability here, but the large amplitude cycles in climate each last around 100,000 years. For example, there are about two of these big cycles within the last 200,000 years. 100,000 years might sound familiar because you've already had a look at the three primary ways in which Earth's orbit changes over time through the online Milankovitch tutorial. And you've learned that these three occur at different periodicities. It takes about 100,000 years for the Earth's orbital path to change its shape from nearly circular to its maximum eccentricity, which is a little bit squashed, back to nearly circular again. This cycle can change the total amount of solar energy Earth receives each year, though just by a little bit. It takes about 41,000 years for the tilt of Earth's axis to go from minimum tilt and back to maximum. We're currently at about 23 and a half degrees of tilt away from vertical, and the tilt's getting smaller. We're on our way to standing more upright. And for precession, which is the one that's really hardest to grasp, the Earth's axis describes a circle in space, completing one circle approximately every 26,000 years. This is the one that influences what seasons happen where along Earth's orbital path. And we'll take a look at those. We saw pretty easily the big 100,000 year cycles in the temperature data. We can analyze the data statistically, and we find that the 41,000 year tilt cycle is also there, and the periodicities associated with precession. First, we'll try a couple of questions. Just dealing with tilt here. Which of these scenarios do you think produces the greatest seasonal contrast? That is, the hottest summers coupled with the coldest winters. You'll need to imagine the Earth traveling around the sun over the course of a year. So let's start with answer A. If Earth were standing perfectly upright relative to the plane of its orbit, we'd have no seasons. The equator would always get the most solar energy, and the poles would always get the least. Moving on to answer B, with a little bit of tilt, we now get some seasonal contrast. Tilt a little more, and we get more seasonal contrast. Those who chose E were correct. The maximum tilt yields the maximum seasonal contrast, really cold winters and really hot summers. Okay, this next question is about precession combined with eccentricity. The diagram shows a highly exaggerated eccentric orbit, just so we can see it better. The Earth passes closest to the Sun on the left side of the diagram and passes farthest from the Sun six months later on the right side of the diagram. Figure out which hemisphere is having which seasons at the two points on the annual orbit where the Earth is shown. Then compare the seasonal contrast in the northern versus the southern hemisphere based on the seasons you figured out. So in this diagram, northern hemisphere winter and southern hemisphere summer are happening at the position on the left when Earth is closest to the sun. You can tell the seasons by the tilt. At the position on the right, we have northern hemisphere summer and southern hemisphere winter. 
in this case, at the farthest point on the orbit from the sun. So the southern hemisphere has summer when we're slightly closer to the sun, and it has winter when we're slightly farther. So based just on solar radiation coming in, the southern hemisphere has higher seasonal contrast than the northern hemisphere. Do note that the seasons have everything to do with the tilt of Earth's axis, not Earth's distance from the sun. If that seems to contradict your mental model of the seasons, remember that when it's winter in the northern hemisphere, it's summer in the southern hemisphere, right? The Earth's sun distance mattered for seasons. We'd all have the same seasons at the same time, which we don't. This is the case today. In early January, which is southern hemisphere summer, Earth passes through the point on its orbit that's closest to the sun. And in early July, we pass through the point that's farthest from the sun. But recall that Earth's north polar axis doesn't always point toward Polaris, like it does today. And half a precession cycle ago, we had the situation in which the seasonal contrast between the hemispheres was reversed. About 11,000 years ago, the northern hemisphere had slightly warmer summers and cooler winters, higher seasonal contrast than the southern hemisphere. Let's think about seasonal contrast and ice sheets. During the past million years, ice sheets have expanded and contracted, primarily on land in the northern hemisphere. If one were trying to grow an ice sheet in the northern hemisphere, would it be best to have high seasonal contrast in the northern hemisphere? That means hotter than average summers and colder than average winters. Or would it be best to have low seasonal contrast in the northern hemisphere? Kind of coolish summers and warmish winters. Some of you may have said high seasonal contrast, perhaps using the logic that colder winters might pile up more snow and increase the extent of winter snow cover. But the problem that arises in the opposite season the hotter than usual summers, which would melt that snow back. It turns out that low seasonal contrast in the Northern Hemisphere is ideal for growing an ice sheet there. And the logic is that there would be, there would still be snowfall during the warmest winters, but during coolish summers, not all the snow would melt away. Some would stick around to be built on during the following winter. If a bit of extra snow sticks around and a bit of extra area on Earth's surface is therefore white and reflective, then a little more of the incoming solar radiation would reflect away. Less would be absorbed, and the Earth would cool a little bit, promoting additional growth in the size of the ice sheet. This is the ice albedo feedback that we saw earlier. It's an amplifying feedback, one that pushes the climate system in the same direction as the initial perturbation. In this case, the perturbation is toward cooling, so the ice albedo feedback keeps promoting cooling. Imagine what happens to this feedback loop if the perturbation is toward less area covered with ice and snow. It still turns out to be an amplifying feedback, just pushing in the opposite direction. In fact, feedbacks like the ice albedo feedback are crucial for explaining the amplitude of these climate cycles over the past million years. Let's look at the actual change in total solar energy received by Earth on average over that time period. Notice that the periodicity of these cycles is about 100,000 years. That makes sense because eccentricity is the only one of the orbital parameters that changes the Earth's sun distance, which can change the total energy we get. The second important thing to notice is the range of numbers shown on the vertical axis. At most, there's a change of a little more than one half a watt per meter squared, from the highest maximum shown here to the lowest minimum. That's not much. Think about the number for Earth's climate sensitivity that we introduced, which was three quarters of a degree for every watt per meter squared. If Earth's climate over the past million years were driven only by these small changes in the total solar energy coming in, we'd see a tiny change in temperature, not the five to six degrees Celsius changes that are observed. What matters more are the changes in where on Earth gets the energy and in which season. So it's the distribution of that incoming solar energy that matters. The distribution is controlled by a combination of tilt, precession, and eccentricity. Small changes in total energy coming in with much larger changes in distribution, combined with feedbacks that magnify those changes, ultimately result in the change in climate. So let's try thinking about an example and see what kind of orbital configuration might help melt an ice sheet. So we established earlier that to grow an ice sheet, it'd be good to have a low seasonal contrast. Conversely, to melt an ice sheet, 
it'd be good to have high seasonal contrast. That is quite hot summers and quite cold winters in the Northern Hemisphere, where the ice sheets have recently grown and receded. So let's circle back around to orbital configuration. What would be a good orbital configuration to melt an ice sheet in the Northern Hemisphere? We're looking for high seasonal contrast in the Northern Hemisphere. So first, it'd be good to have summer happen when Earth passes the sun at its closest point of approach. Northern Hemisphere summer is in June, so we can eliminate two of the answer choices based on that information. Next, you already answered a question about tilt and seasonal contrast. The greater the tilt of Earth's axis, the greater the seasonal contrast. So high tilt angle, June 21st, close to the sun. The changes in Earth's orbit can nudge the climate system toward warm or cold, and then feedbacks like the ice albedo feedback amplify those nudges. Here's another important feedback that operates on this timescale and also helps amplify changes in temperature. Let's look at temperature, which we've already seen. It's the blue line, together with atmospheric carbon dioxide measurements from ice cores in Antarctica. That's the red line. These carbon dioxide measurements are a good representation of global atmospheric carbon dioxide because the atmosphere mixes quickly. There aren't big differences at different locations on these timescales. If we look at these global temperature estimates and the atmospheric carbon dioxide measurements, both going back hundreds of thousands of years, the two records are clearly correlated. High concentrations of carbon dioxide occur at about the same times as warm global temperatures. Low concentrations of carbon dioxide occur at about the same times as cool global temperatures. Let's have a look at these two combining together in a feedback. Imagine that something happens to make Earth's temperature get a little warmer. This might be something to do with the orbits, changing the distribution of incoming solar radiation with latitude. In any case, imagine a perturbation slightly in the warmer direction. In the oceans, there's some dissolved carbon dioxide gas. At warmer temperatures, the water can keep less carbon dioxide gas dissolved in solution. So if the water warms up, some of the carbon dioxide gas will come out of the water into the atmosphere. You're probably familiar with this effect if you've ever opened a warm can of soda. Often what happens is that a bunch of gas will bubble out immediately. But if you open a cold can of soda, there's just this subtle fizzy noise. Similarly, if the oceans warm up, some of the carbon dioxide in them will outgas to the atmosphere. More carbon dioxide in the atmosphere means that the strength of the greenhouse effect goes up, which promotes further warming, which promotes further outgassing of carbon dioxide from the oceans, etc. In this example, the perturbation is towards warming. So the carbon dioxide temperature feedback keeps promoting warming. You can imagine this feedback loop starting with a perturbation that makes global temperatures get a little colder. Same processes, just in reverse, and still an amplifying feedback. So this is our geologic backdrop. During the past million years, Earth's climate has cycled between warm and cold periods, with the cold periods about five to six degrees Celsius colder than the warm periods. These cycles happen regularly at periodicities that match the periodicities of the cyclic changes in Earth's orbit around the sun. Look at the values for atmospheric CO2, the red curve. Its axis is on the right. Over the past million years, CO2 is cycled up and down from highs of about 280 parts per million to lows of about 180 parts per million. Today, atmospheric CO2 is close to 400 parts per million and rising. Notice that at no time in the past 800,000 years has Earth's atmospheric CO2 concentration been anywhere near as high as today. The value today is highly unusual and the rate of change is highly unusual compared to our geologic context. It's not changes in the total amount of energy Earth receives that matters so much for these climate cycles of the past million years, but rather how the solar energy is distributed over the globe and how that translates into seasonal contrast. Also crucially important are feedbacks happening here on Earth, which amplify the subtle pushes given by the orbital changes. In particular, the ice albedo feedback amplifies warm and cold extremes through the melting or growth of ice sheets. And feedbacks between carbon dioxide and temperature do the same, amplifying global temperature changes in the direction of the initial perturbation. In a later lesson, we'll take a look at the most recent climate changes, those over the past couple of hundred years, 
and compare them to what's been happening in the past million.